My name is Xiang Cheng. I'm an assistant professor here in this department. So I'm going to talk about some of our research. So um, my group, we study motion of particles. This including uh, big particles all the way down to really small, tiny nanometer colloid particle, nanoparticles. So uh, I have a lot of things to say, but I'd like to focus on one thing, which is our study on big particle here. And the reason why I choose that is because granular materials, I will give you some exam uh, examples later, is really uh, everywhere in our daily life. You guys are all familiar with this uh, materials. The second thing is that a lot of the research I have here on granular materials is actually driven by undergrad students in this, in this department. Xiao is sitting here, but I have many other undergrad students, great undergrad students working on the project I have. So we got some very interesting results. That's why I want to talk about that here. So just some quick, uh, quick introduction. What is granular materials, right? Granular materials is a large collection of discrete microscopic particles. It's everywhere in our daily life and also in industry. Just leave some example here, a pair of hazelnuts, rice grains, and some exotic examples. The ring of cytone actually is a granular materials. It's just made of big marbles and rocks. And this is actually an ideal case to study granular gas because you don't have gravity there. So you really have just marble and grains that collide with each other. You create this very beautiful granular gas. And there's a lot of theory about the, the, the patterns of uh, cytone rings. And of course, surface of desert on Mars, that's a granular materials. And uh, this is a big applications in industry and uh, in environmental science, in agriculture, and also in basic science. I'm sure all of you has played around and actually had do research on granular materials, right? This is something that we all play around when we're, with, when we're small kids. Uh, but I want to say a little bit more why we are interested in that. What's the special physics we have from granular materials? So granular materials show very unique behavior different from standard and familiar form of matter. It has gas phase, it has solid phase, it, it can flow like liquid. But all the common equation we have for describing the state of matter cannot easily apply to granular materials. It displays a lot of energy and show very nonlinear interaction between grains. So one very special example, very unique for granular materials is when the density of the grains are large, we have a lot of grains, it actually can jam and show this very beautiful jamming transition behavior which could be a disaster for a lot of industry applications. And another thing that makes granular materials hard to deal with is because they are made of big grains. You may think that I can use a statistical mechanics of thermodynamics to describe these materials, but the answer is no, because, because they're big grain, temperature does not play any role in this type of materials. You don't have thermal motion for the grain. Once you put the grain there, they stay there. Even though you have large degree of freedom in the problem in your materials, but you cannot use temperature to describe what happens. So in that sense, granular materials are extremely cool. Essentially, temperature equal to zero for this type of materials. And also, granular materials make up big grains. That gives us a, actually a very good model system for a lot of interesting non-equilibrium physics problems, which I, I'm going to give you two examples which are related to our research. So the thing that I'm going to talk about here is related to how granular materials respond under fast and quick impact. So I'm going to put some impact force on granular materials and see how the materials respond. The first project I'm going to talk about here is about how granular, how you make craters on granular materials. How you make craters by liquid drop. Okay? Again, as I said, I like to talk about something that we all see in our daily life. This is very relevant to a lot of things. If you have rain heating on the backyard, uh, you will have uh, liquid drop impact granular surface. This is related to drip irrigation in agriculture and related to dust suppression in industry. And there's another very interesting phenomenon. This is a paper published in Nature about five years ago where they, they found there's a fossil light granular bed where you can see these craters. The author claimed that those craters are actually from raindrop impact crater 2.7 billion years ago on Earth. Now why this is interesting? The reason why this is interesting is by looking at the size of the crater, you can know the terminal velocity of rain 2.7 billion years ago. And from terminal velocity of rain at that time, you can back up air density on Earth 2.7 billion years ago, which is actually a big deal because sun is much younger at that time. If you com compute sun energy, sun ray energy on Earth, 
If the Earth's air density is the same as what we have today, sun ray is not powerful enough to heat up the surface of Earth, then you don't have liquid water. Life evolution will be a problem. There's some hypothesis saying that air density actually is lower. You have fewer guys, uh, fewer air on Earth. That's why sun ray can penetrate. And there's no evidence for that. Those authors that claim that this is the first evidence to say air density actually is a half of what we have now. It's a big discovery at that time. But as engineers or physicists, we're interested in the dynamics behind this process. So I'm going to show you two high-speed videos before I talk about physics behind it. The first video, I'm going to release a three millimeter water drop, small water drop, and let the water drop impact on granular materials, which in this case is 90 micron glass beads, very tiny glass beads. So I'm going to release a drop about five centimeter above the bed. And I'm shooting the video at 8,000 frames per second, really high speed video. So now this is what you see in this case. So you have drops spreading out. The interesting thing is that the drop actually can bounce off, accumulate a layer of granular materials on the surface, and then fall back on the surface of the bed. So we call this shape here as a liquid marble, because you have liquid drop coating with the armor of granular particle on the surface. And I have another one here, where now I release a drop at a higher height, about 1.5 meter. In this case, you see typical splashing patterns. You get a pancake at the center of the crater. So now let's look at the shape we get at the end of the impact. This is a typical shape you have, OK? So what you see here is two features. The first one is, of course, you get a crater. And the second one is you get some granular residue at the center of the crater. So I, I can have two lens gills, one is the size of the crater, one is the size of the granular uh, residue. So I'm going to measure both. But let's look at the granular residue first, and then we'll look at the crater size later. So let's measure this. Again, this is some excellent undergrad student in my lab. He started the measurement here. He measured the size of the granular residue, how big of this bowl here, as a function of the impact energy essentially the kinetic energy of the raindrop, when the drop comes down with certain kinetic energy. So what you see here, the general trend is the larger impact energy, the larger the granular residue. And the different curve here is for different drop size. So I varied the drop size from 1.4 millimeter up to 5 millimeter. This is essentially the, 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 the range for natural raindrop. So if you go outside, when it's raining outside, you measure the size of the raindrop, you, it's very hard to get a raindrop about 5 millimeter. The reason for that is when the drop coming down from really high height, the air drag is so large. If you have a big drop, it will tear apart by the air drag, and it will always get a smaller drop. So this actually covers the ruin drop size pretty well. And what you see here is that there are two regimes. When the impact energy is low, you get a slow increase of this granular residue. But when you're above certain impact energy, you start to shoot up. And this happens for all different drop size. Now let's look at the shape. And so if I have a small impact energy, you essentially get this uh, ruin shape uh, structure. What happens there is actually straightforward to understand. When you have a drop coming down, the drop will spread out. When it spread out, it will accumulate a layer of granular particle at the interface between the drop and the granular bed. And the drop retract back. When the drop retract back, the layer of granular particle interface will basically cover the whole surface. And now you can think about it. you really have a liquid marble, center is a liquid drop, water, outside is a granular beads. But when the water drains to the bed, you left with a wall or ruin of granular particle at the surface. That's what you see there. Now you can imagine if I increase the impact energy, it gets some shape like this. The reason for that is now you have higher impact energy, it means that you fall down from higher height, you drop spread out even more. You accumulate more particle at the interface, because now your interface is larger. When you retract back, you code one layer of granular particle interface, but that's not enough. You have to push more particle toward the center, because you accumulate so much particle, you have to push them in. Now you get a thicker layer of granular beads at the interface of the drop. When the water drains in, you get a thicker wall. That's why you can get this kind of a donut shape a structure. Now even go further, now you spread even larger, you accumulate so much particle. When you retract back, cover the first layer is not, not enough, second layer is not enough. Eventually, you have to push all the particle to the center of your drop. You basically get a solid pallet. That's what happens at this transition point. 
But now you can imagine if I go to even higher height, what's going to happen? If I go to even higher height, the drop spread out even more. When I retract back, there's no enough space for me to store my particle. Eventually, my particle is so dense, it will stop my retraction. And then you get a shape like this. You get this asymmetric shape because you get a lot of fingers when you spread out. When you retract, the finger cannot fully retract back. You actually stop the action of surface tension, give you this uh, non spherical shape. And then you get kind of a sunflower pattern and you get splash pattern. So I encourage you, when it's raining outside, go back, go to your backyard and check. You probably will see all those shapes in your backyard. Right? Some practical thing. And of course, based on that picture, we can predict what happens. I won't go to detail here because there's some argument in fluid mechanics, but the essential idea is that using the picture, I just tell you, I can predict the shape of my liquid marble as a function of impact energy. Those are the solid line I have in my, in my curve there. And on top of that, I can also predict at what point my grain is so much, so many grains, I stop my retraction. That's giving me the start point. So if I plot the start point, which I call critical impact energy as functional drop size, and my theory predict how this should behave, and my experiment just really follow on top of that without any fitting parameter, I can really know at what point my, my retraction stopped. OK, so that's sort of that part, which basically allow you to understand why you get different patterns when it's raining in your backyard or on the beach if you go to the sea. Um, but what's more interesting here is actually the size of the crater. How big of the crater you can generate? How does the crater size relate to the impact energy I have in my system? Before I tell you that, let me tell you some classical experiment people have done many, many times. So instead of a liquid drop, a lot of people just drop a ball bearing, in this case, steel ball, into sand. And they ask, when I have a ball bearing here on the sand, how big the crater I can generate on the surface of sand? So they do the measurement. It's a little bit small here. This is the size of the uh, crater, normalized by the size of the ball, and plot that as a function of impact energy. You get this beautiful power law saying that the size of the crater go as energy to a one quarter power. You can un understand that actually pretty straightforward from high school physics. What you have here is you have your impact energy. Your impact energy going to remove all the sand in the crater outside the crater. And then you can ask how many sand I have inside the crater. That is related to density of the sand times the warming fraction, meaning how you pack your particle there, which is a constant, times the size of your crater, volume of the crater, times, of course, gravitational acceleration times d. This is mass. Um, uh, uh, mass times g times d, this, this gives you basically the gravitational potential of a sand particle. You have to use your energy to remove the sand. This you equal the impact energy to the potential energy of sand particles. Now the question is, uh, how big of my crater? The size of the crater here is proportional to the diameter of the crater to a cube, with some constant in front of that, pi, four, three, whatever. Here, I assume also that the depth of the crater is also linear proportional to diameter of the crater, which is you know good assumption because the depth and diameter, they are all land scales, they should relate to each other. Now you have d cubed from the volume of the crater. You have d from the height of the crater or depth of the crater. You put them together, you get d to the fourth power. Now you go to the another side, that's tell you the diameter of the crater should go as energy to one fourth power which essentially explain what you see here. Very good and very simple energy analysis. So now let's look what do we have for water case. If I drop water, I measure the size of the crater as function of impact energy. Again, for different drop size, I see a power law, beautiful power law here. But this power is clearly smaller than a quarter power. It's 0.17. Now we think about this, why that happens? and how we understand this. We spent a lot of time on this. And one of my students, he searched all the literature. When Apollo programs very hard, a lot of people study the crater on the moon. They actually study how the size of an asteroid crater relate to impact energy of asteroid. What they found there is the size of an asteroid crater go as impact velocity to 0.34. Remember, we have impact energy, which is kinetic energy, half mv squared. So that means that. You can transform this formula to impact energy. The impact energy power is 0.17. Okay, this is very similar to what we have. Not only that, 
Because when they do the experiment, they do very careful experiment, they call the skating, Smith's whole cycle skating, they essentially have a dimensionless form for diameter. So if you calculate dimension of all those terms, this exactly gives you a dimension of meter. So they don't give you only the impact energy dependence, but they also tell you how this depends on the size of the asteroid, diameter, oh sorry, the density of the asteroid, of course, gravitational acceleration. If it happens on moon, you just put a moon uh, uh, gravitational acceleration there. So I just tell my student, okay, we have the skating. Let's use this fi uh, skating feed our data. They don't believe me. They say, well, this won't work. That's asteroid or the raindrop, how it can work. But I force them to do it. So if you do the skating using this uh, smooth host apple skating, you essentially can collapse all your data to a single line there. And this pre-factor pre here is on order one, 1.74. It's really beautiful. Okay, so raindrop creator really follow this uh, Schmidt's host apple skating to all the quantities that you have here. Of course, in this case, I have to use the size of my raindrop. I have to use the density of water for my skating here. And then we did more experiment. We tried many different combinations. We tried nine different type of uh, low viscosity liquid. We tried seven different granular particles, some hydrophilic, some hydrophobic, all different variations. We even try at two different ambient pressure because again, we think about the moon, there's no air pressure there, there's vacuum. So we try everything and all our data can collapse together by this simple skating relation. So that's really dramatic. But that's not the only thing. We also look at another structure in the crater. That's the shape of the crater. So all these three data, this is from moon, this is from Mercury, and this is from Mars. What I plot here is the diameter of the depth of the crater versus the diameter of the crater. Depth of crater, diameter of crater. For all these planetary bodies, there's some common feature. That is, when the crater is small, the depth of crater is cha essentially changed linearly with the diameter of the crater for both moon, Mercury, and Mars. But when you get a really large crater, this linear relation breaks down. So the reason for that is when you have very large crater, the wall will collapse due to gravity and then you basically fill up your bottom, you will get a shallower crater and larger crater. But that's not what we're going to consider here. We're going to consider what they call simple crater, where you don't have collapse of wall. So I plot all the three data together in a one single plot. I'm sure astronomers know this a long time ago. I didn't check the literature, see who found this, but I just do this myself. I was really surprised that no matter what's a planetary body, they all collapse together meaning that they have some universal aspect ratio. So again, this is showing you the depth of crater go linearly with the diameter of the crater, and the aspect ratio here is a 0.2. That means that the diameter is five times larger than the depth, okay? That's what you have from planetary bodies. Now the natural question is to ask, how about raindrop craters? What's the aspect ratio of raindrop craters? So same data, I just plot in a larger scale here, so I leave some space here. And this is the Moon Crater, Mars Crater, and Mercury Crater on this line. Okay, now this is our liquid drop craters. Without any fitting parameter again, it's just a full on top of this line. Of course, there's a huge difference in the diameter here. This is a, a seven order magnitudes in difference in terms of diameter of the crater, 20 order magnitude difference in terms of energy. But no fitting parameter, they really just fall on top of this line. And there's some another high-speed, uh, uh, hyper-velocity, solid sphere impact uh, experiment. I'm not going to talk about that. But the key thing is that if you do a low-velocity, solid sphere impact crater, your aspect ratio is not 5. So this is some experiment, as I mentioned before, a lot of people do solid sphere impact. The solid sphere impact, the diameter of the crater is about 7 times larger than the depth of the crater. Okay? So only when you use a liquid drop impact, you get this universal aspect ratios. So then the natural question is why is the Schmidt's whole cycle skating? Why is apply in our case? So I'm not going to do the detail here. Again, there's some math going in, but general idea here is that the reason why you can have a Schmidt's whole cycle skating is because one big factor you have during impact. When the asteroid impact on Earth, or on Moon, on whatever the planetary body you have, there's a very strong energy partition, meaning that not all the impact energy going to create a crater. There's a big fraction of the impact energy going to melt the, the asteroid, melt the surface, so it's going to be a, a, a become a thermodynamic energy. So over 97% of uh, kinetic energy actually turns into the heat. 
So same uh, idea applied to our case. We have liquid drop impact coming in, and the impact energy actually not going to create a crater 100%. You are going to turn that impact energy to spreading energy of the drop, which causes dissipation of the drop, essentially turning into the heat eventually. So I'm going to have that argument, but I'm going to save the step. The bottom line here is that we're using this type of argument, we can actually predict how the equator changes as a function of impact energy and all the other parameters I have in my experiment. Uh, the good thing is actually we can also predict what's the prefactor of my scaling. Remember, the experiment tells us the prefactor here should be 1.74. I showed it before in the data. And our theory actually can calculate the prefactor, which gave us a 1.86. So pretty close. Give us a good result. Now I want to discuss the physics even further. So why actual impact crater and liquid drop crater give you the same scaling? Why they show very similar physics behind it? So let's compare those two processes. If you have actual impact crater, astronomers studied this again many, many times, a lot of, talk, lot, um, lot, of lot of paper on this. So what they found is that the key dimensions number determining actual impact is what they call front number. This essentially compare the potential energy of asteroid over the kinetic energy of the asteroid. If you compare this number for the asteroid case, it's between 10 to negative 6 to 10 to negative 2. And if you do liquid drop impact using the experimental parameter I have, you found that this dimensional number is between 10 to negative 4 and 0.1. Actually, they overlap really well between the two cases. The reason for that is asteroid is big, but asteroid has a higher impact velocity. Our drop is small, but we have much smaller impact velocity. So in this sense, these two values match each other really well. The second thing is when astronomers simulate uh, impact uh, process, they always treat the surface as what they call Bingham fluid. What's the Bingham fluid? Essentially, it's a fluid with yield stress. That's what you have for Earth, yield stress, and show shear sending behavior. And we know granular materials that we use in our experiment is a very good model for Bingham fluid. It also has shear stress. Uh, yield stress also shows shear sending behavior. But this two is not enough, because if you only have this two, solid sphere impact should give you the same result. The question is why solid sphere impact does not give you the same thing as asteroid impact. That's the third part. If you think about what impact, what's the impactor? When people think about asteroid impact, they always think about a hard ball hitting another hard ball. But actually, that's not the case. If you think about asteroid impact, the impact pressure is 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 gigapascal. The temperature here is way above 2000 C. In this extreme condition, nothing is solid. So essentially, most of the asteroid impact, when that happens, is vaporized asteroid. In some cases, they become liquid. In that sense, that liquid drop actually provides a better equation of state for the impact. That's why we believe that drop impact gives you a better analogy to asteroid impact. At this point, I want to review history a little bit. It's a very interesting history. So who is the first guy uh, proposed that the crater that you see on the moon is due to impact? Actually, that's a hook. And this is a portrait of hook. Actually, this is a modern uh, portrait of hook. I'm not sure whether you know the history. Newton and hook, they really hate each other. When hook die, Newton destroy all the portrait of hook. So you don't know what hook looks like. And modern poetry actually based on the contemporary description of what hooks looked like, so this hook. And everyone knows his famous book, Michael Graffia, right? The, uh, the name cell is coming from this book. You know, he's the first one using microscope to look biological samples, and they found cells. But what's less known is that at the end of this Michael Graffia book, he actually also talked about creatures on moon. He actually has a telescope. At that point, Galileo already had a telescope. I think a telescope is available to him. And he looked at the moon, he see craters. And then he proposed what's the origin of those craters. So I amplify here. He said that the first was with a very soft and well-tempered mixture of tobacco, pipe, clay, and water, into which, if I let fall any heavy body as a bullet, it will draw up the mixture around the place which for a while would make a representation not unlike those on the moon. So really the first idea that what you see there is from impact. But suddenly, he immediately, immediately said that that's all bullshit. Okay? So this is the next sentence. He's saying that, but considering the state and the condition of the moon, 
there seems not any probability to imagine that it should proceed from any cause analogy to this. For it will be difficult to imagine whence those bodies should come and next how the substance of the moon should be so soft. So he didn't know that there should be an asteroid. I was surprised by that, but because at that time people should know there's something falling from the sky, right? And he didn't believe that moon surface so soft to give you the crater. Even though that, we still give him the credit. He's the first one to propose the crater you see on planet body is due to impact. So what's his solution? He's basically saying that, I just uh, save here, basically saying that could be some air bubble trapped inside the planetary body. The bubble rise up, it's like a volcano, and then you give you a crater. Okay? So actually we test that idea. We, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, description. So Xiao sitting here, she started this uh, project here. So we're actually looking into the uh, uh, explosion crater. So this is again, high speed video showing some uh, explosion craters. And we measure the size of the explosion crater as function of impact energy. We look parallel and so on and so forth. But I'm not going to go detail here. Actually, we compare the bubbling crater with the impact crater. And we're trying to see maybe Hook is right in certain sense that you can describe the crater with a bubble. The other thing that I want to mention very quickly is actually we're also looking into how much impact force you really have from a drop, right? So if you think about cratering process, it coming from two parts. One is the drop impact on solid surface. The other is essentially the solid sphere impact at crater. So we combine those two, you get liquid drop impact crater. But we are just curious really how much impact force you can have from a small drop, right? So going here. So this is a, some quiz question for audience here. How much do you think the raindrop force will have? You know, if you work outside when it's raining, when the raindrop hitting on your head or hitting on your palm, you will feel it. It's not a really small force that you cannot feel. So the question is, order magnitude, what, what is the right number here? And even think about 10 micro, sorry, should be Newton. 10 micro Newton? No? How about 10 milli Newton? Anyone think about one, two? Three, okay. How about one Newton? One Newton there. Okay, a lot of one Newton. Of course, then 10 Newton is too big. One Newton, actually, what do you got from Newton, really? The apple, ball, apple falling on your head is about one Newton. Okay, short, not really high apple tree, right? That's too large. So the raindrop is about 10 million Newton. Okay, that's how much force you will have from liquid drop. One Newton, essentially, really what Newton feel when the apple fall on his head. So we did some experiment. So we actually do a lot more than that. We're increasing viscosity of drop from low to high, and we can measure the impact force. We have very delicate high-speed force sensor underneath the drop. You can see how the force increase. And let me show you the detail here because the scale here is too small. You see the maximal impact force. This is the impact force as a function of time. At this moment, the drop touches the surface. You see a quick increase of drop impact force, and then the impact force, of course, will decay. The maximum force you get here there is about 10 milli Newton. This, even though it's small, but actually there's a big um, relevant thing for industry. If you have a wind uh, a blade, the, uh, the tur uh, turbine blade outside for the wind electricity, or the repeat uh, impact of a raindrop actually cause a lot of damage on the coating layer on the, on the turbine uh, blade. So 3M people, for example, they're very interesting to see how much impact force you have, of, you have from uh, raindrop. Uh, force. And there are a lot of uh, very interesting discussion in that direction. But I'm not going to the detail there, so let me summarize the first part of my talk. So I tell you something uh, liquid drop impact on granular surface and how this relates to actual impact. And the uh, essential thing is that these two seem completely different phenomena actually have some common mechanism behind them. That's why they show very similar structure. Okay, so before I go, uh, go further, any question on this part? Very good. OK, let's move to the second part. Second part, so I still want to study the impact you know, response of granular materials. But now, instead of uh, I light solid sphere or drop, raindrop heating on a granular surface, I'm going to have a granular materials heating on a solid target. Right? I'm going to have a granular jet heating on a solid target. So this is, again, something that you can really do in your kitchen. Instead of granular materials, you can have a you know, water jet from the faucet and let the water jet heating on the solid, this, in this case, a cylindrical cylinder. You will get this beautiful water bell structure. Right? 
water jet coming down the solid surface and spread out to give you this bell structure. The first guy studied this is Saubert. I'm not sure whether you know him. This is a beer Saubert law in ENM, you know, electromagnetism. This is the same guy. You know. He doesn't have any high-speed video like what I have, but he drew a beautiful picture with water bell. So we want to do a similar thing for granular materials. Okay? So what I have is a very simple experiment. Again, something else we, we, we did together with undergrad student helped me to do this research. So we have some granular particle packed into a, a glass tube. And then we have some high pressure gas. We open up the wall, high pressure will push the granular jet, a granular column will heat on target in front of this, uh, uh, this tube. And we see what pattern we got, right? So let me again show some videos. In this case, we have 100 micron glass beads very small bees, and we have the target here much larger, five times larger than the size of the jet. And when this thing hitting on the target, what you see is it just spread out 90 degree into this very thin sheets of granular materials. You can do something else. You can use a very small target. Right now the target is the same size of the jet. If the granular jet heating on this target, you start to see this a cone of granular sheets. And while the sheets are expanding, it's become so thin, it's almost transparent. You can see the target inside the cone, right? So we can do some measurement. For example, we can measure the angle of the cone. We found that the angle of the cone apparently depends on the size ratio between the target and jet. If the target is really big, we get 90 degree flight plane. If the target is small, we get kind of a small cone structure. And uh, we can do some uh, fluid mechanics calculation, which allow us to actually predict what's the shape of the cone. That's not really hard calculation. But that's basically saying that we can understand the cone structure. But that's not my interest. My interest is this one here. So we know that uh, this video doesn't work for some reason. I don't know. OK, so we know that if you have a ping pong ball, heating on the wall, you just draw a ball to the wall, the ball won't go to 90 degree. It will bounce back, right? Very clear. You have another ball you heat on, it will also bouncing back. But why, when you have a large number of particles going into the target, you start to form this uh, liquid sheath, like really water going outward. What's happened there? So to prove this problem, what do we do is pretty straightforward. We keep the size of the tube the same but we vary the size of the bees I have in my tube. If I have a very small bees, very small sand particles, I see this 90 degree plane, as I showed you before in the movie. But when I use a very large particles, I, I can still see the plane here, but then you see some particle that are moving away from the plane. If I use a very big particle, I think in this case, I probably only have two or three particles, three particles across the diameter of my tube. Now you don't see any fluid-like plane anymore you start to see this particle-like like behavior. Right? It's like firework. You don't see the fluid behavior anymore. You got a particle behavior. Now you see a transition. If you have a lot of collision between particles, you see fluid behavior. If you have a very few collision between particles, you start to see particle behavior. Now I'm going to go to the most interesting, I would say sexy part of my talk. This really relates to something that we don't expect. And this is what happens in RIG. This is a relative Wistig heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National Lab. What they do there? They have this uh, kilometer size or 10 kilometer size uh, accelerator, right? They accelerate very heavy ions like gold or lead and collide them at the GeV scale, so huge energy. The particle moves really close to the speed of light. And these two heavy ions, they just smash into each other. And when they smash, because energy is so high, it actually decomposes into quark and gluon. And quark gluon interact with each other and then flying out. And then from what the pattern, what's the distribution of quark gluon, you know, uh, uh, when they're flying out, they claim that this quark gluon plasma is a liquid. And this, I think, is uh, uh, number one or top 10 physics discovery I think in 1988, uh, uh, yeah, 1998 or something like that. The reason why this is interesting is because people know that at a few seconds after Big Bang, the energy is high enough, our universe actually is quark gluon plasma, QGP. Right? This is saying that early universe is liquid rather than gas. Now, how does this relate to my research? Right? This is completely different again. 
in different uh, regime. So let's think about the evidence they provide to show coagulant plasma is a liquid, why they say it's a liquid. Now let's think about two cases. The first case, you have your gold atom or ion moving out of the screen, moving out of the screen. The another ion moving into the screen, right? The dash one is the another ion. They do this, what they call Handan collision because the two is perfectly overlap with each other. Now, after collision, you generate a lot of particles, protons, neutrons, whatever. I don't understand high energy physics well enough to tell you what do you have. But because the interaction here is systematic, when you look how the particle flying out from this collision area, you see a uniform distribution of particles. Essentially, when they do experiment, two ions collide at this location, and they put a huge detector around this collision area, and they measure the di distribution of particles around this area, they see uniform distribution of particles. And that's, that's easy to understand because everything is symmetric in this case. Nothing fancy you can get from here. But what happens if you have a non-central collision? You have one ion here moving out, and one ion here moving in. You have collision area, which is essentially like Elmo. Now you have asymmetric collision area. What are you going to see? Now, one argument is that if collision of quark gluon is independent from each other, essentially you have a, a gas here. And after collision, each particle can choose any direction randomly. You essentially will have, still have a uniform distribution if there's no uh, coupling between collision, right? They collide, they select any direction with equal probability. You add all the possible collision in this area, you still have uniform uh, distribution. That's one scenario. The another scenario is that during the collision, the interaction between quark gluon is so strong, essentially the whole thing here become a liquid. When you have a liquid, you can talk about hydrodynamics and equilibrium concept. Remember your transport class. If I have a liquid here, at the center, I have a higher pressure. That's from my liquid pressure. Outside here, I have vacuum. I have zero pressure. And because the axis here is short than axis here, that means that along this horizontal direction, I will have a higher pressure gradient. Pressure difference from center to outside same. But because the distance here is small, I will have a higher pressure gradient. If I have a higher pressure gradient, I will push more particle along the horizontal direction and fewer particle along the vertical direction. I will have non-uniform distribution of particles surrounding my collision area. And that's essentially what they see in their experiment. And that's why they can claim during the collision, you create a liquid. Now let's see what do we see in our experiment. So remember, the first experiment I showed you there, I have a cylindrical cylinder heating on a target. Now you can easily just treat the target as a mirror. So you have one jet heating on the target. It behaves like two jets heating each other. And because my jet is cylindrical, if you look at the collision area, collision zone, is a spherical. Now, of course, you expect to see uniform distribution particle in this antimusal direction. That's essentially what you see. If you look from side, you see your particle essentially just spread out uniformly across all the direction. Okay? So we want to do something like that, like what the uh, rig has. We want to create a collision zone which has an elongate shape, non-uniform shape, non-circular shape. So the way to do that, actually pretty straightforward in my experiment, I have a cylindrical jet before the jet hitting on target, which behaves like a mirror. I will have the jet passing through a slot which has a rectangular shape or non-circular shape. When the jet passing through this elongated shape slot, my jet cross-section area will be elongated. And then I will have this non-circular jet hitting on a target, which essentially behave like two non uh, circular jet heating on each other. I want to see how my particle distributed in the anti mutual direction. Let's do the experiment. So this is the setup I have. So I want to remind you, I look my target from behind. So the jet will moving out. And the jet has a cross-section area elongated in this way. So the jet is elongated along horizontal direction and shorter along the y direction. So the jet moving out of the screen, I will look at how particle distributed uh, behind the target. OK? Uh, just like that, right? This is my target. This dash line is my target. And this is my cross section. Of, uh, this is my target. And this is cross section of my jet. But I want to remind you one thing that if I use a big particle, I should see particle behavior. If I use a small particle, when I have a lot of collision, I should see fluid behavior. The first one I want to show you is when I use a big particle, how my particle distributed around my interaction uh, collision part. So this is a video. 
Again, it doesn't work, so let me, this is important. Let me just restart here, and hopefully it will work. Okay, let's see. It still doesn't work. Uh, I don't think I have that here. Well, you have to believe what I say. Sorry about that. I will have some picture later, but you. So if you do this experiment, essentially when the jet hitting on a target, you will see uniform distribution of particle because you essentially have a particle behavior. The particle hitting on a jet, hitting on a target, was like random direction. Eventually, you will see uniform distribution. But if you use a small particle, you will see non-uniform distribution of particle. So when you have a jet elongated this way, you have more particle flowing outside upward, and you have more particle flowing downward, very few particle flowing from sideways. So to convince you, this is the picture that we can have from that video. Essentially, we have, we have particle behavior. You see your particle is pretty much uniform in behind the target. But when you have a small particle, when you have a fluid light behavior, you see more strong momentum transfer along the vertical direction. Remember, in this direction, you have very short axis. And then you have a small momentum going sideways, where you have a long axis. And of course, you can do even more than that. You can change the cross-section shape of your, your jet. You can have a very long shape and almost circular shape. And then you can see the asymmetrical distribution of particle change dramatically when you go to longer and longer slot. You get more and more particle going this way, and fewer and fewer particle going along the long axis of your slot. And uh, you can, of course, quantitatively compare this with rig. And this is our experiment range with, uh, uh, as function of the aspect ratio of my slot. And the rig result actually is beaten this too. We can actually reproduce the how asymmetry of the particle distribution really well in our simple experiment. The big difference, of course, our thing is a $10 experiment. There is a billion dollar experiment. And it's a very funny story that we uh, submit the paper to physical regulator. And because we have this part of a claim, the editor found five referees for our paper. Three of the referees from granular field. They started reading particle flows. And two referees from rig. And all the granular people saying that, oh, your talk on the corn, everything is good. You can publish. But get rid of the last part of the analogy. This is a make, doesn't make sense. And rig people really like it. Rig people said, this is, good, this is great. This is a really classical analogy of what happens in rig. And of course, we argue with the editor that granular people, they know nothing, right? So we have to listen to rig people. And we got this in, uh, in physical letters. And I want to also mention that this is not only happens for rig and for granular materials, it also happens for degenerate uh, Fermi uh, atoms. This is the uh, uh, AMO experiment, right? Cold atom experiment, where you hold Fermi atoms in this uh, cigar shape, but then when you release the trap, you can see this Fermi atoms liquid really expand along the short axis here. Again, because you have a higher pressure gradient along this direction. And the expansion along this long axis is very small. So eventually, you get you know, opposite extension in that direction. Again, similar physics behind the two. Uh, let me quickly conclude my talk. So I show you the impact response of granular materials. Show you two experiments, very simple experiment, but I think it's a very fun experiment. One is a granular impact cratering, the other is a granular jet. And I show you some transition between different phases of granular materials. In this case, is a, a solid uh, phase to liquid phase. And this case is a liquid phase to gas phase. And I want to emphasize that granular materials are simple. Again, you can see in your daily life. But I believe this really provides a very good model for a lot of interesting physics problems that you can see. So in that sense, I like this conclusion better than the one that I have before. This is two great writers and uh, a poet. And they are all in 19th century. And the first one is Hugo. Everyone know him. And he said that, who could ever calculate the path of a molecule? How do we know that the creations of words are not determined by falling grains of sand? The second one is William Blake. He's less famous. Actually, it's said that when Hugo died, he was already, he was already a nation hero. Uh, Blake, his uh, poems not get discovered 20 or 30 years after he died. So, but look the point he has here. He said that to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your head and the, uh, eternity in an hour. I really like the, the point there. OK, with that, I want to thank a lot of people, especially undergrad students working in my lab, 
who really put a lot of time and found a lot of interesting uh, results we have, and also the funding agent I have here. Thank you for your attention.